Hello, everybody. Welcome to our final installment of our discussion about the Remembrance of Earth's Past series, or the Three Body Problem series. I apologize, it's been a while since our last one talking about the Dark Force, but we are here now today to talk about Death's End. My name is Mark. Here with me today is Matt. Hi. And Orion. Hello. And we're going to go through Death's End. As I said in the other installments, these books are highly, highly recommended by us if you want to avoid spoilers, because we're going to be spoiling everything. Or if you have any inkling of wanting to read these books, if you're a sci-fi fan, I would highly recommend reading them first before listening to the podcast. But also, I'm not your mom, so do what you want. You're an adult, probably. I wonder how many non-adults listen to this. I don't know. You don't have that demographics in your statistics? I don't. If you're not an adult listening to this, tweet Mark at the Thoughtful (laughs) Gamer. That's not my Twitter handle, but... Oh, and I should mention that this podcast, along with all of our other podcasts, are brought to you by you guys, or at least the very specific people who help out on Patreon. So if you'd like to support us, go to patreon.com slash the Thoughtful Gamer. Not only will you be able to help us out, but you'll get some cool rewards uh, alongside of it. Join us in our Discord where we talk about board games and other cool things like the three-body problem. Yes, like books and movies. And those are the main three things, I think, books, movies, and board games. (laughs) Other nerdy topics if you have nerd interests. But without further ado, let's talk about Death's End. So if you listen to the podcast about the Dark Force, you know that it ends in a spectacular fashion where Luoji basically puts Earth and the Trisolaris alien race in a mutually assured uh, destruction scenario where he is going to broadcast the location of Earth to all of the universe if the aliens do bad things. So we're at a kind of tentative standstill, and then you get the Death's End, and it opens very interestingly in two ways. First of all... Before you even get to the text, it has a timeline of the history of Earth, basically. Uh, or at least in terms the history of... History of humanity. Humanity, yeah. And it projects that history into the future far beyond where we've gotten. Because we're... We've... Like, we've got millions like, what, of years. Like, yeah, millions of years. Or a few hundred years in the future at we're the like end of Dark 400 Sand. years in the future, about. Yeah, when, when the Trisoloran fleet was discovered... It was calculated 400 years until it reaches Earth. Although it does reach there a bit faster, I believe. Or there's a second group that has yeah, faster engines yeah, that surpasses yeah. In that the first book, it was 400 years, and then the second book takes place in the middle of that period. Sure. Uh, so we're only a couple hundred years in the future, but it almost like spoils things, but not really. At least I tried to think about it and what different things would mean, but I wasn't able to get a lot of information just from the list of the different eras that it talks about. So it talks about the common era, the crisis era, the deterrence era, post-deterrence era, broadcast era, bunker era, and galaxy era, the latter of which is the one that goes out millions of years in the future. Keeping I mean, this with... was insane, opening the like front cover of the book. Yeah. After, you know, reading reading the first two books and... J- yeah. Just one, like, uh, what happens next? I don't know. But, like, you open the cover and it's like, this is going to go on until what happens millions of years later? That's insane. Yeah. The first book covers, like, one person's lifetime. The second book covers a few hundred years with a big jump in the middle. And this book, this one is kind of all over the place because the main character keeps going to hibernation and then waking up, like, 50 or 100 years later. Right. Which is how you kind of see all these different errors for errors from mostly the same uh pov Mm -hmm. and yeah you get you get the whole (laughs) you get a much much broader scope of just what it's what you're being shown yeah so let's talk about that first scene well well, also i want to mention it follows the theme that i know we mentioned before Mm -hmm. of the scale of the story grows at a kind of exponential curve in these books and he's just right at the front broadcast that uh, yeah, and I think not and I think that was <laughs> absolutely effective. Um yeah. it it gives you a sense of scale before you even jump in to the first scene. And 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 then immediately and, the and immediately, first scene yeah. is a flashback to uh, the sacking of Constantinople. 
Constantinople. 1453. It's still medieval then. Very, very late yep. medieval. Yep. Well, that kind of marks the end of the medieval era, right? That was a big turning point. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, and it flashes back to a wonderful little, almost like short story. You could read it by itself. Yeah. 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 Honestly, like it's a little, it's a little story about a witch. Maybe yeah. the only, wh- what does it say? Maybe the only true witch in the history of uh, humanity. humanity. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Who can teleport herself basically. Yeah. And she gets assigned to do some kind of assassination, but it fails. She loses her powers. And Constantinople Constant- Falls. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but it's wonderfully written. They should release that as a short story. Yeah. By itself. Um, um, and and, and, and I, mean, I still, at the end of the book, had no clue what that was about until you guys told me. And then I felt like an idiot. <laughs> yeah. But it's just a little bit. But, but no, but when you're reading it, you have no clue. Why is this mystical story included in this? Yeah, especially since the whole thing has been. Like, like we, we talked, talked about, about before, pretty much hard sci-fi. The like, hardest of sci-fi. Like, it stays within theoretical limits. At least things like scientists talk yeah, about, yeah. right? It, and the liberties it takes are on the extremely theoretical. The liberties it takes are are with the things far past our understanding in ways that are conceivably plausible. <laughs> sure. Right, like the dimensional folding of the proton yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Oh, also foreshadowing. I just realized that. Yeah. Dimensions are all over the place. Yeah. Dimension, <laughs> dimensions factor in very strongly. So going through kind of the early narrative very briefly, you get the short story and then you jump to a new character who has this uh, terminal disease. And there's a little bit of, there's like a, it almost feels entirely new and different because you follow this person. You don't quite know what's going on. Long story short, they launch his brain into space. <laughs> By dropping nukes behind a solar sail. It, it, this was really interesting. So the second book was all about the wall facer pro- project. Right. So, and, so and for it people, seemed, I guess, if you haven't, if you're just jumping into this and haven't heard kind of the lead up, the very broad story is that there's an alien race. They're coming to Earth to presumably take us over because their own system is very, uh, it could blow up at any time. And the second book is all like, how in the world are we going to stop this? Yeah. And we find the mutually assured destruction way, yeah. but it's shaky, you know. Like it. Yeah, and we and we we got to that through this wall face, facer project, which seems so significant in the second book. But I loved in in when when this launching a brain into space gets mentioned, that project was christened the same day as the wall facer project. Oh, I forgot about. Yeah, that. so you actually get a scene at like the UN equivalent. Mm-hmm. And in this, like, we're going to launch a brain into space is like this completely other side note that was completely irrelevant to the second book. But then, you know, as we find out later, this brain launch into space has has some significance. And you like forget about it for half the book. Like it's the yeah. the first couple chapters after the prologue short story thing. And then you just don't come back to it for a couple hundred pages. <laughs> And the idea of launching the brain into space is that we want to be able to communicate with Trisolaris, but we don't know how to meet them with current technology. They figure out they can use this nuclear blast propulsion system, but they need to get it down to a certain weight. And so the solution ended up being, we'll launch a brain and just hope that they have the technology on their end to make that worthwhile. To like reclone the person. Yeah, Yeah, to like regenerate the consciousness of this dead person. Spoiler, it works. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, yeah, it certainly works. I mean, throughout these books, the humanity vastly underestimates the technology of alien races. It's kind of this, again, the, the hubris kind of proud nature of humanity is is often exploited. But in this case, it, w- it was a little bit to our benefit, or significantly to our benefit. Yeah, yeah. So that happens, and then... I guess we can jump to the next era, the post-deterrence era. Essentially, you have the introduction of a new character, Cheng Jin. I'm hoping I'm... I, I think I pronounced that decently. So at, at the end of the Dark Force, yeah. Luo Ji figures out the mutual destruction thing, and he is christened the sword holder because he's holding the equivalent of the dead man switch. Right. And he basically meditates and looks at a wall for... 50 years or for the rest of his life essentially until they decide it's time for a new sword holder and they elect this lady chang 
to be his successor. Yeah. Right. Which, which uh, quick side note as as we do the his story of going from like this ridiculous hedonism in the second book to actually saving holding the fate of the world holding the fate of the world to the picture that we get of him in this third book is just so is is just so fascinating. It's so interesting to see who he has become. Right, right because, because you know in any mutually assured destruction scenario, it's this it's this game of chicken, and so. At this point, we've guaranteed that Trisolars can share technology with us, so they take away a lot of the, the barriers they had in the other books for technology advances, but at the same time, there's, we know they're still trying to get an edge somewhere, and so he dedicates that last portion of his life literally staring at a wall, meditating, making sure he's strong enough to be able to destroy all of humanity in case they attack via, again, yeah. displaying the coordinates of Earth. So... In this post, I think it's actually the coordinates of Trisolaris, which would give consequently gives away the location of Earth because of the earlier transmissions in the first book. Correct. Yeah. In this post deterrence era, well, we have to talk about the scene that that gets there. Right? She gets assigned to take over because he's super old by then. He's like 150 years old or something, and it's such a cool thing that happens that they know that. The Trisolarans are using basically statistics to figure out what to do. Yeah. Because they can monitor us and they've been monitoring everything. So they're using like their understanding of human psychology, advanced statistical analysis. Yeah, which, which the former, we should note, this incredibly warlike culture has an understanding of our culture to the point where they create great works of art. Oh yes, I forgot yeah, about that. Like most, I think there's 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 some scene with like the Oscars and like most Oscar winning movies are now produced by Trisolarans. Yeah, they figured in their out space our psychology ship. so precisely that they now have like conquered art. Uh, but as the moment that the sword holder position transfers over to her, their predictive algorithms determine that she won't be strong enough to push the button and the second it happens they attack i think they even start moving before it's transferred like in in anticipation yeah um but essentially it's instantaneous attack and And she doesn't she doesn't press the button and they destroy the deterrence mechanism yeah yeah Uh, which is such a tense scene it's one of those scenes you know we talked about a lot in the last couple the, the scenes that i would really cannot wait to see in a movie or a yeah, tv show yeah so much meaning is packed into this scene like basically all of humanity is being characterized in kind of this masculine feminine sort of duality mm-hmm. in that in that scene and it's super interesting especially to see from a chinese author which is slightly removed from you know the culture that i am in it's just, so it's it's you know it's a slightly different masculine feminine duality maybe than we see. Well, yeah, it's, um, I think the masculine feminine thing is used. I mean, it's obviously metaphorical, but it yeah it tends along the lines of the masculine characters, which I think is pretty much characterized by Wade, the American yes. uh, general guy, and Luoji to some degree. But to some degree, is exceptionally pragmatic. Yes, and just like utilitarian odds making, whereas. The kind of feminine metaphor is much more, I mean, I'm I'm hesitant to say virtue focused because, you know, I studied virtue ethics in college, but it does feel like that where it's like there are some principles that Mm -hmm. you just can't violate. Yeah. And I don't think that, yeah, like she didn't know what she was going to do going in. So when she took up the sword, metaphoric sword, Trisolaris had decided that they were going to attack at that moment. And so that attack comes, and she didn't know what she was going to do. I, I, Certainly, yeah. yeah. It, she she thought, thought, well, she, she thought she'd be able to do it, or else she wasn't going to be able yeah. to. She wouldn't have taken the position. She thought she was strong enough to yeah. do it and, and ultimately wasn't. She also thinks thought of herself as like the mother of humanity. Uh, that was one of the strong kind of themes they describe in those scenes. Right. Yeah. Of kind of her relation, and they voted for her because of that dynamic, and yeah. because they had lived so long in peace, they kind of shifted away from wartime pragmatism to valuing other things. Right, and at this point in the, in the story, 
I, I got concerned along those lines. I got concerned because it certainly seems like the author is falling into support of the uber pragmatism mm -hmm. and the masculine yeah. metaphor. But in the end, I don't think he does at all. I think, in fact, he goes entirely the other way. But he doesn't shy away from, obviously, there are consequences if you... Right, there are sacrifices with doing right. Yeah, I you know, honestly... In, in this in moment, I couldn't. I couldn't say us... what his conclusions are, but I, I can just say that it was such an interesting. Those things played out so interestingly. I mean, I, I think I think the author's deeply humanistic, and I think he really mm -hmm. by the end yeah. you understand he falls in support of kind of human virtues. I guess you could call it. But oftentimes, when you're looking at ethical decision making, you try to find very simple, clear examples to nitpick and find out talk through difficult eth ethical problems case studies right or yeah, thought case experiments studies. yeah sure yeah. in science fiction like this you can do that but i think lou does the exact opposite by making the examples huge and messy and involving mm -hmm. like all of humanity and big giant ideas which is something that science fiction almost uniquely can do yeah which yeah. i i absolutely adore yeah so anyway she takes up the sword and she doesn't use it. So we we move into the post-deterrence era. Yes. And along, around there in the story, we jump to a different uh, setting, I suppose. And that's of these two ships that are trying to escape Earth. Or rather, one of them is trying to escape Earth. The other one's kind of the police car trying to flag them down. It, yeah, actually. And this is a product of that that era. The Blue Space was one of the ships from that doomsday battle that the, escaped the battle of darkness at the yeah. end of dark forest that yeah, runs and, away right. yeah and basically uh, they basically took a very pessimistic view of you know the possibility of of earth surviving i think and right. so so they which they, was illegal which was illegal and then it, it's interesting as like this book covers so much time we we, un, we we come to understand that at different points in times like the blue space was um lauded at some points in time, as humanity was in kind of its darkest hour, I think. But then in the following kind of era of peace, they come to see the blue space as, you know, war criminals who abandoned humanity. And I love that that scope of like, not only whole humanity, but whole humanity over 400 years where much has happened. Um, you get different views of the the, the same events. Um, but yeah, so humanity had sent a second ship in pursuit, and, and we get to spend some time with right. them. And that's, this is where it starts getting a little trippy, because they find patches of four-dimensional space. Whoa. And for a while, you don't quite know what's going on, but they figure it out, and they're able. some of the characters are able to kind of duck into 4D, and it's very yeah. cool how he describes it, where like yeah. it's like... If you focus on something, like it just becomes sharper, or it becomes more detailed as you look at something, like infinitely, In infinitely deep. detailed, and you see, and you and you basically lose your parts. depth perception. Yeah, right. And you see all sides of it at the same time. Right. And yeah. all layers. And of all it. layers of it. Yeah. yeah. It, Which is it, very cool. Beautiful descriptions, and it's interesting. The first couple tastes we get are like these dreams. Or like these scenes that we don't know if they're real or not. Correct. And like it's it's playing out in terms of like psychology. Like are these people just going crazy because they're on a spaceship? But, but they, they get they find these four dimensional patches and they don't quite know what to do. But they're able to get an understanding of it enough to utilize the four dimensional patches tactically. So when the sword holder situation fails. The droplet ships, the Trisaloran droplet ships that are with them attack, but they're able to stop them through four-dimensional maneuvering, basically. And they describe it almost like, I, th I thought it was very cool, I, I vaguely remember them describing how they defeated the droplets almost like those glass uh, structures you can make. You know what I'm talking about? They're incredibly strong, except at one point. Right. It's like Saint something something... I know exactly what you're talking about, but I don't remember it's like what it's Saint called. Saint John's yeah. Tears or something. Like yeah, that. yeah. It's, it's a structure you can make with glass blowing if you like have it on in a ball and then you like stretch it. So yeah. there's a tail at the end. Yeah. So you you can incredibly hard. You can like smash it on one end 
and it won't and it'll be fine but you can like just break the tail with your finger and the whole thing will shatter yeah they kind of describe it like that which i thought was very cool anyways so they do that and they're kind of floating along or they defeat the droplets and then they realize oh our deterrence has failed we we ought to just display the location so they doom everyone by they broadcast they broadcast broadcast broadcasting location of earth or trislar you know both of them yeah so basically triggering mutual destruction triggering the dark forest situation where we know that if something is broadcasted to the universe the universe doesn't have enough information or the different species out in the universe don't have enough information to know if that location is safe so they take the safe route and kill it yeah preemptive action so then we're in that situation that's the broadcast era and so basically at this point the entire main conflict of everything that's happened before which is what do we do about trisolaris disappears yeah like the trisolarians just kind of s- stop coming towards earth they're they're so fun who is their emissary mm-hmm. just kind of like retreats back to her treehouse and they start reformulating their plans <laughs> they have no use for us anymore yeah or earth is basically a sinking ship at that point yeah and humanity has to figure out now how on earth do, I guess that's also pun not in, intended, do we stop from being destroyed by some unknown outside entity? Spoiler, it's not on earth. So this is where we get to the fairy tale, right? They're working on this and then they get this random transmission out of nowhere because they're basically, they have no ideas. They have no good ideas. And they see Trislaris get blown up and so they're just kind of waiting to die. <laughs> So then they get this transmission out of nowhere from the brain that got launched into space back at the beginning of the movie or the book. And that guy was like in love with Chang, the main character lady. So he is kind of projected back. They they send back a hologram of him and they set up this meeting where the two of them are allowed to talk on very restricted topics. At the, uh, what's the point? The Lagrangian point? Yes. Yeah. 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 I, always thought, I thought that was cool. That's like the the... This, the, the solar system s- meeting si- point. point. Yeah. yeah. So they they go there and he t- he starts telling these stories, and they're 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 pretty interesting stories. And eventually, you realize a- afterwards they go back to try to analyze these because they're like he's got to have be sending us some kind of message in these, and they figure out that he must have spent you know decades inventing and teaching these stories and perfecting a method of how do I communicate with Earth without tipping off Trisolaris? And how do I, what can I communicate and what, you know, advanced technology can I pass along through this medium of these fairy tales? And there's three of them and they each have a different kind of um, lesson and technology that he's trying to share. And so they they take them and they, they figure out that, well, we have two approaches to survive the in, in, incoming Dark Force strike and uh or or i think there's technically three but one of them involves they call it the bunker project and they yeah there there are definitely three proposed there's three proposed solutions and we should mention the the way that trishlaris was destroyed and the way that luoji's spell destroyed the other random system random star um they send in what they call a photoid which is this planet-sized mass moving it almost the speed of light which causes a supernova in the system and destroys everything more something like something yeah. along those lines and so they're like well in that scenario if we build a bunch of space stations and hide behind jupiter we'll survive and so that's plan one and then plan two is they they figure out that the fairy tales you can you can basically signal to the universe that you are not a threat by enclosing your solar system in a reduced speed Reduced light speed black hole. What? Which we'll come back to. The the <laughs> the implication is that if you're inside a black hole, nothing can get in or out. So they other but it's people. It's not like a true black hole, right? It's yeah. just it's reducing it enough. It's not a black hole in the sense that you're crushed into a singularity. It's a black hole in the sense that light is slowed down, and if you cross the border you would be torn to pieces or torn into submolecular whatever well you still can't travel at more than the speed of light so basically it's saying we could not get out to harm you if we wanted to yeah encasing yourself in this bubble yeah yeah 
Uh, and then the third one is if we invent light speed, we could go find another planet. They figure the last two out from the fairy tale. I think the bunker one, they just kind of like, well, that's kind of the practical solution, if I remember correctly. That's probably right, yeah. They figure I out from the fairy tale this method of... Well, they don't know how to do it. They don't know how, but they, they at least know it's possible. Uh, a method of near light speed travel. Or was it exactly light, light speed? Or near light speed, I can't remember. I don't remember. Somewhere. It doesn't really matter. Yeah, it doesn't. They also, they also know that Trisolaris has achieved light speed because they see the trails. Yes. Um, and there's these kind of weird bubble shapes that I don't know how else to describe them that yeah. show up on their long-range telescopes. So, right. yeah. Matt, you, you I mean, talk about this light speed travel this, thing. This is... It's so cool. And I, I have never heard someone write fiction with light speed travel anything like this. Um, and I, I love going through the different like Star Trek versus, you know, I don't know, Star Wars isn't like hard sci-fi, but, you know, the different means that you could do life, light speed tra- travel are fun to think about. One of the categories is manipulating the curvature of space, basically. So what what these... What 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 Death Zen does is basically says if you manipulate the curvature of space so that it's basically so like what's behind you is bigger in some sense and what's in front of you is smaller, then just the curvature of space will propel you forward. How I thought but, of it, and maybe it's how he described it specifically, is that you're uh, you're effectively curving space so that the the thing that right in front of your ship so that you're always on for lack of a better term a downward incline yeah i think that's another good way to that's a good way to think of it but um the thing that i have never heard anyone else do is suggest that well you can't just curve space and then move on like nothing like happened. nothing happened space is now curved you have changed you know the that You've changed the fabric of space time and that in that, shows in up. that area yeah so like orion said earlier like we we note that these weird kind of milky trails coming from trisolaris where their light speed ships had you know launched off permanently changing space and therefore the speed of light um yeah and it kind of radiates out a bit right yeah i think so yeah. yeah yeah so you create these bubbles of lower light speed reality you ba- you've basically like stretched out space time or something yeah. yeah so it's not as simple as like you create light speed travel and then you can bounce back and forth between two places no you have permanently changed the space from which you came yeah that's uh it's it's so cool and and, and so um i mean basically what we learn as we go on is those those second two plans that you mentioned are really tied together light speed travel requires bending space which effectively reduces the speed of light in that locale and, and if, then if you do that very precisely you can generate the sort of reduced light speed black hole that you would need to perfect protect yeah. your whole solar system yeah. right at the consequence of light now travels at, you know, 100 meters a second instead of 30 million. So computers kind of don't work. Right. And it, it completely lots of other things. technology. Yeah. But your civilization will live on. Yeah. This was all madness. Yeah. But again, shortening, condensing this down, uh, Earth chooses or humanity chooses the bunker idea. So they build a bunch of space stations and hide behind Jupiter. Uh, in the shadow of Jupiter. I won't go into too much deal. There's a lot of interesting conflict that happens there between yeah. the main characters. Hu- humanity, I will say humanity if, mostly thrives. The, it does decently, yeah. As a now solar system species. Yeah. I will say, I guess we'll jump ahead to the main character, again, hibernates into the future. Wade, the military guy, is tasked with pursuing in secret the light speed idea uh, because they don't believe the bunker project will will be effective but he has to wake chang up if there's any situation in which he was in which to proceed further with his plan he has to kill people uh which is what happens and again she chooses kind of the the nobler path or at least right so there's this crazy scene where they have figured out conceptually how to do light speed and they need to just scale up the project but it's been banned by the solar government because of the the space time stretching <laughs> permanent changes that they know about so they say that's completely legal you're not allowed to do that 
so he's worked out this way well we're we're he he says basically we believe this is so important that we're willing to fight for this light speed engine and they've gotten some antimatter bullets and it's gonna it's all gonna go down and so she goes in and negotiates and says basically shut it all down you can't do this and so you're back to the situation hiding behind jupiter and then we realize through another very cool scene that actually no we flash over to a new non-human pov for the first time since the first book or no we we never left human pov no we did for a bit we switched to trisolaris i think for a little bit I, when book. we when we visit the trisolarin um radio operator we're at least kind of like sure that's the interface between humanity and and another uh, race but no this scene is just a completely new pov and i love it it's such brilliant not really satire but just again exploding the the scale of this and it goes to someone some alien entity who's at a post you know looking over the universe and sees something kind of troubling thinks uh he knows how to do a nice quick simple easy solution talks to basically what's perceived as like a middle manager and they're like yeah whatever go ahead and launches the attack on our solar system go to the back to the pov of humanity we realize that the attack is not going to be one of these supernova causing you know just make the sun explode it is in fact a dimensional attack where they send some thing yeah. that <laughs> they, 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 they send they send a little bit of two-dimensional space yes in some kind of wrapper which we don't understand yes but they literally send a little patch of two-dimensional space to us which then will collapse everything in the area into two dimensions where you yeah which causes I, maybe my we, f- probably my second favorite scene after the end of the dark forest my second favorite scene where Basically, humanity realizes it's completely screwed. There's no escaping it now. We're going to collapse into two dimensions. Certainly, that kills people. (laughs) Uh, That kills people. Our bodies uh, don't really handle that well. And our main character goes to Pluto, where humanity has stored some relics and artifacts of our civilization yeah, and they just start launching it out, right? The plan is to spread it out so that future civilizations can see it in the two dimensional space that yeah. it will become that the solar system will become. Yeah, so they're like, "Well, we yeah, so well make an art gallery." Yeah, yeah. So you have this incredible scene. Oh, and, and you uh, run into Luoji there. Lu- 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 oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah, he's the he is now the curator of this museum on Pluto, which has like the Mona Lisa and <laughs> yeah, like the. <laughs> What's the, uh, didn't they mention some of the terracotta warriors were there? Yeah. There's yeah. a bunch of, like, famous art famous throughout this stuff, Earth's, yeah. yeah, history. Yeah. Just, like, in, like, a bunker. S- sitting around in a bunker. And, and they, they have to sit there, and they're, they're like, well, we guess we better choose what to throw out. Yeah. <laughs> but they don't really yeah. care. So you have this incredible scene with, like, the, you know, the greatest of humanity's artistic achievement and we're looking back on a collapsing solar system, you know, with inevitability, considering this is it for human humanity. Yeah, and the remarkable thing is that Chang, at that point, doesn't doesn't fall into complete despair. Like no, she she holds strong and believes that humanity still overall accomplished something that was good and noble on the whole, and is proud almost. Which is really just remarkable as they sit there and literally watch like the moon collapse in the 2D space. Yeah. Um, and, and the planets slowly, you know, snap into these massive two dimensional things, which is just incredible. I love that scene so much. It, it's beautiful. It, yeah, it really is. It's, it makes you think about, you know, things again on a different scale than you usually think about. Yeah. But then we get to the very final act, the very final thing where she manages to hop on uh, one of the light speed, speed or the only light Basically, speed they, ship that was made. Basically, they did secretly make one light speed yeah. prototype, yeah. and they put it on our ship, and she blasts off. Yeah, where... With, with one other person. Yeah. And I won't go into the details of what happens there, but essentially what we find out kind of cosmologically yeah. is that... Well, she the... she flies to her star that her boyfriend bought at the beginning with his inheritance, 
right? And they plan to right. meet him there, yeah. and then they kind of get some. Then that's when the story really zooms out, and you get a galactic perspective on things. Right. And the perspective you get is essentially that because this kind of dimensional warring is kind of the technological endpoint, yeah. that it's been happening so much that we're basically at the end point where everything's going to collapse down into a new singularity. Whereas in the, the idea being that, that the universe not necessarily, started... Not necessarily. It's, okay, sorry. It, imprecise wording. It's that they, they said basically, they theorized that the universe started as like some nine or ten dimensional space. And at this point, yeah. it's gotten all the way down to two, three, four dimensions in different yeah. areas. Yeah, a, a quick flashback when we were with blue space in in testing out that four dimensional space there's actually a scene where they go and explore that and they mm-hmm. they talk to they an entity there interact with an entity there which is basically bemoaning um, the complete loss of their existence because they had been existing in four dimensional space which is now collapsing into three dimensional space which is the phenomenon that these spaceships find and, you know, is... Right, the idea being that they, describe they crossed it as like, into... They're on, like, the edge of a dimensional attack. Yeah, yeah. And all of human civilization came after the results of that dimensional attack, which dropped it down to third dimensions. Yeah. And they're hitting, like, little patches of what remained of the four dimensions. That yeah, and, and then on Pluto, you, you watch the three-dimensional collapse into two. Some of the rules of the universe still apply, so... Stop me if I'm jumping too far ahead, but I think kind of the ending, the the end of this is that basically the universe is going to either expand forever or collapse. And if it collapses, there's going to be possibly some kind of rebirth, um, a, new big know, bang. Another, a new Big Bang. And, and there are certain galactic factions that are working to make that happen. Well, they theorize that. They're... Uh, so, I guess so, so whether or not area. whether or not that happens or not is just a matter of physics, and it's a question that I think the universe will eventually. I, I forget what I think. The I think at point different is, points in, in amount... our history of science, we've answered that question differently of whether or not it, the universe will expand forever or eventually collapse in on itself. But it's certainly tied to the amount of mass in the universe. So we get this incredible scene where. Basically, they go to a parallel dimension, right? One of these g- galactic races that is so far beyond humanity comes to uh, the planet that that the two hum- human survivors are now on, and basically gives them a universe. And basically, they they transfer a small amount of matter into this very closed universe. They have the ability with technology to create universes from this universe but that takes matter out of this universe and then we get to the final conflict of the entire story yeah where they realize they've taken too much matter out of the universe for it to be rebirth well they get this message in a bottle basically from the faction that's trying to collapse the whole universe to rebirth it saying everyone out there in pocket dimensions and pocket universes return your matter to the universe so that we can have a rebirth yeah, and then yeah. once again, she makes one final yeah. non-pragmatic decision because it's it's a prisoner's dilemma thing, right? Yeah, like there could be there thousands, could be billions, uh, billions of these pocket universes. And according to game theory, we would we would theorize that it would be fruitless to donate it back because enough people wouldn't, or you know, yeah, intelligent beings wouldn't do it. But again, she she makes the non pragmatic hum- humanistic decision and does donate uh, the matter back. Yeah, and that's where we end. That's the whole, that's the end of it. Yeah, yeah. Which I think is oh, it's it's just lovely. I, I love the again. It boils down to the masculine feminine uh, metaphor of different yeah. ways of looking at what is the correct path, and this is why I think and- he he very clearly states a position at, by the end of the book. Yeah, yeah. You said earlier that a lot of the times stories will break these massive themes down to very small scenes to analyze. But in this story, we're, we're like looking at the entirety of humanity to, to talk about those. You kind of get both at the end there. That's true, yeah. Because all of humanity are is this new family now. 
these these two survivors that and and, I, and they have a daughter, don't they? Am, am I, they? They have a family in their pocket universe. They yeah, have, they basically make for them a little human like cottage and you know some. Yeah, but that is all of humanity. But it's also just in a. In, it's just also a beautiful human scene. You don't even need any science fiction, really. You could, right. You know, you could, you could not. You know, as this the is described, underneath the dirt are you know machines and whatnot that carry on the illusion that this is a little farm. But you could just not dig up those those you know all those machines underneath the earth there, and it's truly a beautiful human scene. So I don't know. You get both of those, and then she makes the choices you describe. Right. Yeah. The, the sacrificing choice, self-sacrificing, and again, not the proud choice either, because that's that's the other kind of main decision-making conflict you have all throughout all the books, is that individually people sometimes make really good decisions, but as a whole, humanity ends up being far too selfish, hubristic, proud, and. You have the conflict again between the individual making the right, the, the 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 moral or correct decision, and organizations and governments and collections of people often making the short-sighted, self-centered decisions. Which you can kind of contrast against UNG at the very beginning of the story making this crazy yes. decision to s- destroy Earth. <laughs> yes, because uh, she hated it so much. We got through a good portion of the story beats in here, but there's still a lot we skipped over very quickly. This yeah. book is massive and it, immense. It, it, I don't know if it's necessarily longer than the other two, but the, no, the, the, the amount of no. stuff that happens is so much more, it felt like. Yeah, certainly because you have those like kind of discontinuous moments where you jump ahead into the future, which is just really incredible writing. Um, he's able to create not only an amazing world, but an amazing world that evolves over hundreds of years and then millions of years. And then we, looking back at the fall of Constantinople story <laughs> afterwards with some prompting, I realized that, oh, yeah, the witch was hitting a little pocket of four, four dimensions <laughs> Yeah, from, from whatever conflict, interstellar conflict happened long, long before people uh, just kind of floated through. Yeah. Oh, it, ah, it's beautiful. Yeah, I still think the second book's my favorite, but this one is so so good and yeah. immense, full of it, big ideas. It is immense. What what was your favorite book, Ryan? I kind of described it as I thought the first book had the best mystery. The second book is probably my favorite, and the third book is just this grand scope and the best technology and things like that. So I I'd, I'd, I'd probably say this the Dark Forest is my favorite, but I thought yeah. they're all brilliant. I, I think brilliant. I think the first was my favorite. Uh, the third had some of the the best scenes, maybe not not just like the Pluto one and then the the pocket universe one, but lots of good th- scenes. There are a lot of great scenes, right? Like in Australia, where it's like the prison camp of the world, and she goes blind from stress and all this crazy stuff. Yeah, yeah. The <laughs> and then the, 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 the other scene, the other scene where the they get two. the uh, the false alarm, dark forest attack, and she's like, everyone's scrambling to get in their spaceships and blast off of earth and they're like kicking people out of the door and oh, yeah. blasting the rockets to burn up people around trying to get on board and that was crazy this one might make the best movie of them all yeah certainly like the first one i think we mentioned this could be a relatively modest budget blockbuster because so much of it just takes place in like a science compound yeah and they're only, you know, they're I mean, only... most of the first book is just like him in the VR or him talking to one other person or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then it's not till the end that you actually see the Trisolaris fleet. This one is the big would be movie. this is this is a large budget <laughs> if you're going to show Heavy CG. Absolutely, very good. Wonderful. Highly recommend. I will probably read them again. Yeah, you, you I'll should too. Them. For sure. Yeah, for sure. But thanks, thanks for listening, everybody. Glad we finally got to this third installment uh, to finish the series. Again, if you want to support the podcast, go to patreon.com slash thethoughtfulgamer. Uh, if you go to thethoughtfulgamer.com, you will find all kinds of board game reviews and analysis. And if you want to talk with us on social media, go to uh, Twitter or Facebook. It's Mark TTG on Twitter, not The Thoughtful Gamer, because I couldn't <laughs> get The Thoughtful Gamer. Mark spelled with a C. Tell us what you think of the three-body problem. 
Yes, yes. I've, I've already heard back from a couple people who were like, oh, I'm so glad you're talking about this book. Yeah. Uh, and they were excited about it. Your so. favorite part. Also, yeah. tell us who you think Skywalker is. Oh, no. You just, they can't jump topics now. Anyways, thanks for listening, everybody. Goodbye. <laughs>